The year is 1979 and a girl was out with her friends and they would do what any other girl would do at that time. But she had such a good time that she thought that she could stay a bit longer and longer until it got really dark outside. And at this point of night, she knew that her mother would be ringing up her friend's mother, asking her that, is my daughter still at your house? Because if she is, she needs to be home right now. But as she was waiting for that phone call to come, she realized that there was no phone call. So she just thought that, you know what, I'll just stay over. So the girl stayed over and she had an amazing time. But soon 7 a.m. would roll around. And when 7 a.m. came, she knew that she should probably start heading home right now. And so that's what she did. She got everything ready and started walking back home. And when she got to the front of her house she checked the time and noticed that the time's 8 a.m so she stood up straight looked herself in the mirror and told herself that whatever shouting that i'm going to receive it's probably worth it because that night was amazing so she takes one deep breath in grabs the door opens the door up and what she saw would truly change her world forever but before we begin today's true crime story if you enjoy true crime stories or just scary stories in general then I highly suggest you subscribe to my youtube channel as that's all i do and i upload once a week but with all that being said let's begin This story starts in July 1979 when Glenna, or Glenn, and her five children, accompanied with her husband, James, moved into a modest home in Northern California where Glenn's brother lived, who goes by the name of Don. And you see, unfortunately for a while, the family was broke because both parents couldn't really hold a job together. So when James finally got a job and could finally keep the job for a bit, the family moved out of Glenn's brother's house and got a small trailer, who funnily enough, Glenn's brother owned it. And for a while, they coasted through life, living a life that they didn't really want to live. But everything would change when James actually got a promotion in this job and the family would move from the trailer to an actual house. And of course this house was much larger than the trailer. And they managed to get this house on a decent price due to the fact the county sheriff at the time moved out from this house and Glenn's family managed to swipe in and take it. And Glenn, her 15 year old son named John and her 14 year old daughter Sheila and a younger daughter, 12 year old Tina, and the two younger sons, Rick and Greg, would all finally live a comfortable life in a comfortable house. On April 11th, 1981, at around 11.30 a.m., Glenn, Sheila, and Greg needed to go to one of their friends' houses to go pick up Rick. And the reason was because Rick was there because he just recently finished a basketball trial. And as they were driving towards the house, they managed to stumble on John and his friend, Dana Hall. And while John was hitchhiking with his friend from a canyon that wasn't too far from where they lived, the canyon was at Quincy and where the Glens lived was all the way at Keddy. And about two hours later they would come back home and they would get changed and get ready to go to downtown to visit some friends. And at this point I hope you're not bored because all this information matters. And during the end of the story all this information will be key so stick with me. Anyways Tina the 12 year old had plans to go visit one of her friends house which was actually adjacent from the Glens house. And at this point John wanted to come back home as well. So Glenn picked up John and everyone was in the house at this point. And as the night came Glenn her boys and one of her boys friends would wave goodbye to Tina as she got picked up at around 8 p.m and while Tina was hoping that she would be able to stay the night but after a while of sitting down and watching some tv Sheila the 14 year old would come knocking on the door and would tell Tina that it's time to come home so Tina got her stuff ready and then the both girls would walk home and also I forgot to mention that John and his friend went back outside for a bit and as Tina would come back home so would John and his friend. And as well, James was at home as well, the husband. Now you might be wondering, why am I telling you all this? And trust me, you'll need to know why. But before we move on to the next day, remember at the start, I told you about a girl that was at her friend's house. Well, that was Sheila. So now the next day, April 12th, Sheila was still at her friend's house because the night before when she dropped off Tina, she went to her friend's house and well, her mother usually would call her to tell her to come back home, but she didn't. So she thought she'd stay over the night, but she knew she should come early in the morning to avoid any trouble. So around 7.40 in the morning, she would leave her friend's house and would arrive at the front door of her house. And well, she would stare in front of the mirror and just get herself prepared to get shouted out by her mother. Because deep down inside, even though her mother didn't call her to come back home, she probably knew that she should have probably went home. And when she was done finally preparing herself, she reached down for her keys. And as she was doing that, she went and held the door up and she would quickly notice that the door was already unlocked. So she opens the door slowly and in her head, she's thinking about that this might be some sort of prank that my parents are playing. 
So now the door's fully open and she could see into the hall. And to give you a better description, there's just one big hall. And to your left is the stairs, and to your first right is the living room. And if you go straight down is the kitchen. And as she's slowly walking in, cautiously looking around, she of course takes her first right into the living room. And as she peeks her head around the room, she instantly saw the lifeless bodies of Glenn, John and Dana lying in the middle of the room. And all three victims have been bounded with medical tapes and electric cords around their neck. So now Sheila is screaming and just because of that scream she woke up Rick and Greg and Rick and Greg's friend Justin who was actually staying with them and they would all come rushing in and they also too would start screaming but I'm going to stop you there because what I told you was actually a lie to some extent because while well, Sheila did discover the lifeless bodies of her family members but the kids weren't there in fact Sheila would run to this house and sure enough when she knocked on the door she found the boys there it was a family that Tina went and stayed over at and they were called the Siebold family and of course, I already know, you might be asking, why would they go over there? And that's where it gets interesting, you see. Jamie Siebold, who was actually a member of the Siebold family, would arrive at the Glen's house. And his own words, he said that he saw something from their home. And so he would actually enter through the back door. And of course, he saw everything. And so in a panic, he grabbed the boys and ran back to his house, where eventually Sheila would come and collect them. And you might be thinking at this point, where is Tina? Unfortunately, at this point of the story, no one knows where Tina is. And so at this point, the police have been called and they would too discover the bodies. And the police would say the murder of these three victims were especially vicious. As they would go on to describe that whoever killed them used two long knives along with a hammer. And one of the knives that was actually being used was actually bent 30 degrees, almost turning into some sort of new weapon. Glenn had the worst of all of it, unfortunately. She was discovered on the sofa, lying on her side, and she was nude waist down and she was gagged with a blue bandana and her own underwear which was all secured with tape and she had been stabbed in the chest but unfortunately gets worse she was stabbed in the neck in a horizontal angle which the wound hit the spine and would break it and on her head was an imprint of the butt of a gun specifically a daisy 880 power line pellet rifle john's throat was just completely slashed dana had multiple injuries and was minorly strangled to death and both john and dana suffered from blunt force trauma to the head caused by one or more hammers autopsy would later determine that glenn and john had died from the knife wounds and the blunt force trauma and Dana would die from asphyxiation. Sheila and the Siebel family would hear nothing throughout the night and again they were all close to the Glen's house only a couple of houses away and again none of these families heard any commotion during the night but a couple nearby that lived only two houses down woke up in the middle of the night and they both looked at each other as they thought that they could hear muffled screaming and so the couple looked out the window and began to search for whatever they heard but unfortunately they wouldn't hear it again so they just chalked it up to their imaginations going wild when the police were searching in the house they found something strange when they were observing the house they noticed that Tina's jacket and her shoes were missing which is obviously strange it was almost like she just left the house or the more logical route would be whoever attacked the family me, took Tina but again it doesn't make sense why would they take a coat and her shoes as well and also while searching the police found a lot of tools missing out from the house from the left out drill boxes that were completely empty to screwdriver cases that were all around the floor they also found the house's telephone was taken off the hook and the actual line was cut off from the outlet and also all the drapes were closed in the house martin smart who was one of glenn's neighbors claimed that a claw hammer inexplicably gone missing from his home and well the police thought that was a bit weird so they decided to investigate further and as they were beginning to interview he would continue to tell different stories and contradicting himself making him the main suspect and while the police would further investigate Martin but the police would state that due to the endless clues that Martin were giving them he was doing this all for attention and eventually they threw all suspicion away from him but in addition to interviewing Martin the police would also interview other locals around the area and of course several Seabolt family members and they would all say that a green van was parked outside the Glen's house at around about 9 p.m. Justin who again was a friend of Glen's kids would be interviewed as well and well he too would offer conflicting stories of the night he would also go on to say that he actually dreamt details of the murder and then he would go on to claim that he actually witnessed the murder he would tell the police that he had woken up in the middle of the night due to some commotion in the living room and he was asleep next to greg and rick and so he got out of his bed and would investigate what was going on and he would reach to the hall and he would get a view of the living room and he saw glenn with two other men one of them with a mustache and short hair and the other one being clean shaven with long hair and also both of these men were wearing glasses and according to Justin John and Dana entered the house for some reason and began to start an argument which eventually spiraled out of control and an actual fight proceeded to start and when this happened Tina actually emerged into the living room and she was actually taken out of the house through the back door by one of the men based on the descriptions that Justin gave about the men here's a picture of the men 
the police sketched out. After the FBI had done some research on who these men could be, they came to the conclusion that these men must have been in their late 20s or early 30s. One of these men stood between 5'11 to 6'2 and they had blonde hair and the other man was 5'6 to 5'10 with greased hair and both of them were wearing gold sunglasses. And so people began to speculate that this could be something to do with drugs and of course the police did as well but that would be shut down due to the police finding nothing illegal in the house. Moving on to Tina, her disappearance was actually started by the FBI because the police would actually forget to report her missing and of course the FBI seen that and decided to start ahead and well the FBI believed that this was definitely an abduction but eventually on April 29th 1981 the FBI had actually backed off the search as the California State of Justice was apparently doing an adequate job and the department began to search a five mile radius around the house and also with the help of the local police but again they couldn't find anything. Moving a couple of years of April 12, 1984, a bottle collector was just minding his own business at a forest collecting bottles until he stumbled onto a bottle and so he grabbed the bottle and saw that in the bottle was a cranium portion of a human skull and well this bottle was discovered a hundred miles away from the Glen's house and well the human skull was confirmed by forensics to be Tina's and so that raises a question of where Tina could have been this entire time and even though a hundred miles is far away but in a four year span to be only gone a hundred miles isn't that far when you put it into that consideration. So people began to think that this was more than just a kidnapping. Also near the remains, detectives found a nylon blue jacket along with a blanket and also a pair of blue jeans missing a back pocket and an empty medical tape dispenser. And shortly after announcing the findings of Tina's remains, the police would actually get a phone call from a mysterious person that told the police that those remains that you found, that's Tina's. And he would go on to congratulate the police for finding them. And unfortunately, the call was never recorded but somehow in 2013 the recording of the call was somehow found at the bottom of the evidence box and even though the exact call that the mysterious guy made to the police had never been released to the public there's another call that had been released to the public about a police officer talking to another officer explaining that that skull that we found belongs to Tina <laughs> Well, I was uh, watching the news uh -huh. and they were talking about the uh, skull who found at the pitfall. Right. Do you have for any help? Uh -huh. And uh, I was just wondering if you thought of uh, the uh, murder up in Teddy, up in Plymouth County a couple of years ago where a 12-year-old girl was never found. Now, this is a girl. I'm pretty sure it's a male skull. Okay. Well, I thought... You know, just maybe 12-year-old girl might be mistaken for a 10-year-old boy. Mm-hmm. And that was Teddy, two years old or Uh, Kate and Teddy, I think. Okay. Up in Plymouth County. Yeah, that's a couple years ago. Several, uh, a couple years ago. Two, three years ago. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll let my husband know about it. Okay, Thank yeah. You. Thank you. Do you have a Thank you. Yeah. On a 2008 documentary, Martin's wife told the news that she thought her husband Martin and his friend John Bow were responsible for the murders. She would go on to claim that on the evening of April 11th, 1981, she had left Martin and John at a local bar at around about 11pm because she was too tired to continue on the night. So she said goodbye to Martin and John and went and got a taxi back home where she would instantly just fall asleep on her bed. And then she stated that she woke up at 2am in the morning on April 12th to find John and his friend burning an unknown item on the wood stove and of course when this came out the police would actually arrest John and his friend and make them do a polygraph test and well they would actually pass the polygraph test so no one knows why Martin's wife would just turn on Martin like that maybe there was something that she was hiding and she wanted to escape it by blaming it on Martin which of course failed but again we don't know but one more thing to enlighten you with with this case on March 24th 2016 a hammer was found and I actually matched the description of what Martin told the police ages ago and this hammer was discovered in a local pond and so the hammer was taken to the police and they would investigate it and unfortunately they couldn't find any DNA or blood samples to it but the police would tell the press that this hammer wasn't just placed here to be hidden it was placed in this pond with an intent to be found until this day this case is still unsolved and who knows it might just stay like this until the end of time so that'll be it for today's video. Comment below your theories on this case. But if you enjoy true crime stories or just scary stories in general, then I highly suggest you subscribe to my YouTube channel as that's all I do and I upload once a week. But with all that being said, thank you for watching and yeah, goodbye.